It's 8 a.m., and that means it's time for only one thing. Heroes of the Spider Woods. The beginning. Okay, some background. Our party consists of a wild sorcerer, a paladin, two fighters, a ranger, and a monk. We all met in the tavern and were offered a quest. We must head to the enchanted elven woods to retrieve a golden cup from it. By elven, I mean they were elven once. The only elves that live in there now are ghosts, zombies, and an occasional cursed fellow. First off, we do some starter quests in the town, nothing too major. We drive off murderous crows and a magic scarecrow from a farm. We take part in a pie-eating competition. We help a blacksmith to clear his basement from corrupted myconoids, and that sort of stuff. All of this done to gain the trust of the local population, and by extension, the local druids. Soon, we earn their trust, but they only tell us they can't help us find the cup at all, since they're not diviners. But there's an exiled druidess in the woods who may know such magic, so we head there. Here, our DM introduces his homebrewed travel system. There's a hex map of the forest, and each time we move a tile, we must roll the survival check. If we fail, he hides all the map from us and then rotates it randomly, so we're forced to remember the landmarks. Luckily, this never actually comes into play, because we have a ranger with us. In fact, we're acting unusually smart for our artistic selves for once, since we do not get lost. In fact, we find the witch's hut pretty early. Maybe a little too early. The hut is there alright, but the witch isn't home. Her guard dog is, though, and it starts barking the moment it sees us. One of our fighters decides to distract it with tasty treats and petting, while the rest decides that the home invasion is a really great idea. We find nothing especially interesting inside, at least nothing we wouldn't expect to see in a druid's hut. Just some basic furniture, a shelf with potions, and a heavily wounded unconscious deer. We barely restrain ourselves from stealing the potions in the witch's absence for five minutes before she arrives. She doesn't take kindly to the intruders at first. In fact, the only reason she decided to listen to us at all is because her dog liked our fighter. Every party member tries to ask her for help in his own way. The paladin appeals to honor and glory of finding a sacred relic, but the witch doesn't hold much love for her order or religion, so she fails. The other fighter asks if they could help her back, but the witch is pretty self-sufficient. She doesn't need anything from murder hobos. When everyone tried their hand, the monk steps in. He pulls a myconid corpse from his pocket. Maybe we could make a deal. Look, I have this. Maybe you could plant him and grow yourself an army, right? The paladin freezes in horror. The sorceress pulls a hood down on his face. The ranger covers his ears. The fighter covers the dog's ears. There's a dead silence in the air for a few seconds, until the witch starts screaming insults and obscenities at us. She polymorphs the monk into a newt and throws him into the bushes with all her strength. Then she stares at us. She continues yelling at us for another five minutes or so, calling us all brain-dead imbeciles and worse, until she finally calms down and gets it out of her system. After successfully deflecting all the blame for a home invasion and bringing a corrupted myconid to the forest on the monk, we manage to finally start a reasonable discussion. She even agrees to help us in order to get rid of murder hobos at her hut the easy way. There's a catch. In order to divine the location of the cup, she needs to perform a blood sacrifice that is likely to significantly cripple one of us. But then again, she also offers us the easy way out. We could simply use the dying deer as a sacrifice and be done with it. Luckily, our paladin is always having to martyr herself for no reason at all. She steps forward and offers her blood instead. Good choice, because it turns out that the witch was bullshitting us in order to find out and see if we were sociopathic enough to murder a defenseless animal to find some bejeweled crockery. We are totally not. So she finally caves and begins to explain the situation. First of all, the forest is divided into three areas of influence. One is controlled by a gigantic minotaur, the other by a hag, and the other is under control of the necromancer. 
Well, that sounds pretty spooky, but we don't actually need to visit all those places, right? She can just find the location of the cup and we'll head there. Nope, she can't. This magic is beyond her. Fuck. That is, unless we find a magic mirror for her. Yes. The magic mirror is located in the hands of the titanic minotaur mentioned above. Fuck. Alright, fine. We're adventurers. We should be able to handle a minotaur, right? After our monk recovers from polymorph, since the witch def refuses to dispel it herself, <laughs> we head out. Minotaur's lair is located in the western part of the forest. As the witch told us, goblins serve him, just like Grimlock served the hag, so we should be careful. Naturally, when we hear be careful, we understand it as get caught in a goblin ambush. For someone of such low CR, goblins managed to put up some resistance, but we went anyway, killing the majority of the fuckers and capturing a few alive. The paladin decides that she has a huge and important business somewhere else while the rest of the party interrogates the greenskins. Turns out they really are the servants of the Minotaur, but we already know that. We probe the fuckers for more information until we learn something new. First of all, goblins assume that we're here to save some huntsmen that we never heard about before. More importantly, the Minotaur has a very unusual pet. A gelatinous cube. Well, it's difficult to call him a pet. He's just trapped him in a tunnel and uses him as a guard. We ask him about how they managed to contain the cube. We are told that it's afraid of fire, so they've surrounded it with torches to keep him still. After learning everything that we need, hold up. How do you gender a gelatinous cube? It's like a giant gelatinous cube like pocket or protrusion? How's it a him? Is it self-identified? These are the questions we need to know. <laughs> After learning everything that we need, we let them go. Grab the paladin and head to the Minotaur's lair. Since our paladin is the only one with dark vision, she decides to walk to the front to scout in heavy armor. This genius idea works out just fine. When we walk into the cave's living room and wake up about 20 goblins or so, we're totally fucked, aren't we? Well, luckily, they aren't all waking up at once, so we're fighting a wave after wave, not a gigantic army. That is, for a few rounds, until they all wake up, and we are fighting a gigantic army. We end up blowing all of our daily resources on a single encounter. We end up blowing all of our hit points, too. In fact, some of us blow them more than once, such as our fighter, who discovered a new fighting style. Fighting style in question is known as corpse tanking. Every single turn the goblins drop him to zeros and stabbed him while he's down to finish him off while he's at zeros, he needed to fail the death saving throw three times in order to actually die. Each successful attack on the goblins part automatically failed one saving throw. However, every round the paladin healed him with lay on hands for one hit point, bringing him back from the brink just so he can drop on the ground and become a pincushion again. The fact that no one died during this encounter was a goddamn miracle, especially since we were all so close. After the battle is over, we barely stop to loot the place. After grabbing and chewing on some of the goblin food, we rush back outside to take a long rest. Since there's no way we're fighting the Minotaur in our shape, obviously, about eight hours later, we return to the cave, only to find out that we're not the only guests here. The hags Grimlock's either dug too deep or assaulting the place on purpose through their tunnels. In any case, this fucking kitchen is now filled with new enemies, but not as much, so we kill them all pretty easily. This time we go slightly deeper into the room to find some kind of a cold storage where the goblins kept their food before slaughtering it. However, there's nothing inside except for a single huntsman. He's really, really happy to see us, especially since the goblins are going to eat him very soon. Oh, yeah, the huntsmen. We've heard about those. Aren't there supposed to be more? Oh, yes, there were more. But some were cooked a few days ago. Then there was a, some huge battle yesterday, and the goblins were hungrier after it, so they ate the rest. Oh. 
We politely ask him what does he mean by yesterday? About eight hours ago. Oh, well, fuck. Okay, that sucked, but at least we saved one of them. It ain't that bad, right? We might want to reconsider our policy on eating strange food found on monster kitchens, though. After letting the huntsmen go, we head further into the caverns, fighting both grimlocks and goblins. Along the way until we find a strange, suspiciously empty tunnel filled with bones. This is the moment where I mention that the DM rolls for the wild magic surge every time the sorcerer casts a non-cantrip spell. I'm mentioning this right now for no reason at all. The walls are decorated with torches, a luxury otherwise absent from these caves since the goblins don't need the light. Yeah, this isn't fucking suspicious at all. Come on guys, even we aren't stupid enough to fall for that. This is where they keep the cube, the fighter deduces. How observant of you. You must be guarding treasures. No, 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 no. I'm gonna go find him and poke him with a torch. No, 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 no. After nearly engulfing himself into the cube by accident, since he can't actually see it until he gets too close, the fighter rips a torch from the wall and does exactly what he said. Well, if he hoped to intimidate the cube with this gesture, it didn't work. He made it angry instead. Some hotheads in the party wants to fight it, that is, until they look up his stats. We all turn and run as fast as we can, and the cube follows. Contrary to the popular myth, gelatinous cubes aren't actually slow. They simply have no reason to hurry. Now, normal human beings would run towards the exit from the caverns and take a long rest again, hoping that the cube will get bored and come back. Or, well, there will be actually somewhere to run to if we're out in the open. Instead, in our panic, we run further into the caverns. We run and don't look back because we don't want to know how close that thing is. We don't look back and we don't look sideways too. We barely pay attention to the whole goblin war camp that we run past. Shot goblins try to throw some spears at us, but we don't give a single fuck about goblins. We need to run. And we run. Straight into a dead end. Fuck. Fuck. Fuck! This is the moment our DM calls for a smoking break and leaves. Meanwhile, we're frantically trying to come up with a plan. Well, not a plan, but at least something to advert our impending deaths. We even remember that we brought a few sacks of salt, for some reason, and we try to come up with some bullshit reasons why it will totally scare the cube off. When the DM returns, he begins describing the horrible screams we hear from the distance. Many, many horrible screams that grow louder by the second. Until they begin to quiet down. This thing just ate the whole war camp. Didn't it? You know what that means. It isn't blocking our escape anymore, and we can return safely. We get all the way back and head down the torchlit tunnel that was previously guarded by the cube. At the end of it, there are two doors. One leading to the west, another to the east. Our paladin is feeling particularly gung-ho today, so she kicks the eastern door down with her hooves. Turns out, this door leads to the war camp, and the cube is waiting for us right behind it. We hastily kick the second door down, only to find that it leads to a bottomless pit. If we head to the left, we fall into the pit and die. If we don't, we'll have to fight the cube. Bottomless pit it is! When we land, it turns out that it wasn't that deep after all, or barely hurt. It's pretty dark in there, however, so we light torches to see where we actually ended up. This cavern may be filled with rubble and trash, but it's still a pretty huge place, big enough to house a second war camp, or a gigantic magic mirror, and a single minotaur. So it turns out, when Grimlock dug a tunnel, they intended to dig their way into the minotaur's chambers and assassinate him. However, Apparently, they fucked it up and collapsed his lair instead. Now we're stuck with a gigantic pissed off minotaur with the warhammer the size of a grown man. After we finish shitting our pants, we roll full initiative and a sorcerer goes first. Finally, it's his time to shine. 
He lifts his hands up and chants the magic words of the catapult spell, Alahu Hawkbar. <laughs> Aloha Snack Bar. A single rock slowly begins levitating above the ground, and then, with a fooshing noise, it smashes into the Minotaur's head, dealing respectable damage. Time to roll for Wild Magic Surge again, and it actually happens this time. Wonder what he's going to roll. Wild Magic Surge table is filled with LOL random trash. He rolls a 7. What does 7 stand for? It stands for Pick Related, a fireball spell centered on the sorcerer. Every single party member is in the fireball radius. We are all level three. We begin to laugh nervously, cause we're in danger, as the sorcerer rolls for damage. It's more than enough to kill us all, unless we make a dexterity save. Our laughter stops being nervous and becomes downright hysterical as we roll for dexterity. None of us, except for the sorcerer, makes it. Fucking lord. It gets worse. Okay, so this is the moment when I've realized that I really, really like this campaign and I want to continue. We can't just die in here, we barely started. And I know that Diem is also putting a lot of time and effort into writing this adventure. He actually did it the Wizard of the Coast way, writing down an entire design document. He put his soul into this thing. He's laughing right now, but there's no way he'll actually be okay with this kind of stupid ending. It takes some time and effort to stop laughing, but I snap out of it eventually. Hey, um, DM, you remember that we all have inspiration points from role-playing from all this? So? Well, you know how 5e is the Leave It Up to the DM edition? And remember how we played Star Wars Saga edition? There were destiny points there, very similar thing. They could be used for all kinds of things, like avoiding damage. Could we maybe use them to, you know, slightly lower the damage from the fireball? Diem is overtaken by doubt, but other players begin supporting me, which happens rarely, and persuading him to listen. Finally, he agrees. Fine, you can have the damage from the fireball if you spend your inspiration, but only this once. And the sorcerer doesn't get to use it since it's his fault. Well, shit. Campaign saved! We are not dead after all, but we're simply nearly dead. And the Minotaur was not in the radius of the fireball at all. <laughs> Imagine being a Minotaur as you go to challenge this group of adventurers, they fucking detonate in front of you. <laughs> Guess my job here is done. Hey guys, this is just a quick bit of promo. We got our website up and running and we have a massive restock on most of the models. However, one of the cool things about the website is if there's a model that you're waiting on, you can enter your email and be put on a waiting list. And it's not just good for you so then you'll know when they're restocked. We can also see what you guys are waiting on and what we should be printing. <laughs> so either way, the models are f by far the best way to support this channel and to help us do videos that YouTube would find inappropriate on the platform. <laughs> and like, let's be serious. The models are pretty based looking. So once again, just look at the titties. Look at the lizard titties. <laughs> but anyway, let's continue on with the video. Okay, so the cast so far in this is Dietrich was the party's first fighter, a human battlemaster. Uh, he's a savant and a learned man, a professor from Reichland's University. He's the one who had the bright idea of poking the gelatinous cube with a torch. Eisen Riza was the second fighter, a human champion. He's a simple man of simple mind. He likes to get paid and doesn't like too much danger. He's the one who buddied up to the dog. Fiona the Bastard was the party's devotion paladin. She's a tiefling and essentially the Luke Skywalker slash Brienne of Tarth character, a wide-eyed young hero. Gunnar of the North was the party's hunter ranger, a quiet man and the only party member with a lick of common sense. His player described him as androgynous, but nobody cared about what he described. Everyone imagined him like Aragorn, since Aragorn was what he played like. Belheimer was the party's wild sorcerer, a dwarf, while Faust was the open hand monk. I'm describing them together in a single line for a reason. Any of you seen the search for the bard green text? Those are the same players, 
different characters. So, there's Barsum, the cursed guardian, the big guy in front of us. Formerly an elf, by the way. However, what really matters is he's a huge-ass minotaur right now. If I could show you his stats right now, I would. But I can't. So just take my word for it. He was seriously overpowered for a low-level boss. For example, he could action surge like a level 20 fighter. Naturally, since we've all barely escaped deaths, we all should take this new enemy seriously, given his ridiculous power. As you might understand by now, must and will are very different things for this party. Because Faust decides to spend his extremely valuable, limited time on a questionable action. He moves towards Belheimer, lying on the ground and burning to death from his own fireball. He takes out his dick and extinguishes his comrade. So, actually fighting the monster is up to Dietrich, Eisen, Fiona, and Gunner. Luckily, they're all well rested despite being heavily wounded. They all have their abilities on their hands. Gunnar goes first thanks to his high initiative. He casts the Hunter's Mark on the Minotaur and manages to shoot him. The Minotaur goes next. He action surges and nearly murders Eisen on the spot. It becomes clear that Barsum must die during this round, or the avoided TPK will be repeated again. Dietrich slashes the beast with his greatsword. As for Eisen, at this point he'll keep fighting well after his death. He simply won't notice actually dying. Minotaur falls when Fiona smites, thanks to the crit multiplying the smite damage, and the monster is finished. Once again, proving that it doesn't matter how big and strong you are. If you're alone, action economy is not on your side. Fine. Now what? Just to clarify, when Gwyn, the Witch of the Spatterwoods, told us that she needs a magical mirror, we thought it would be a small mirror on the wall, like the one from Snow White. We did not expect a 16-foot-tall monstrosity in a golden frame encrusted with gems. We still need to bring it to the witch, somehow. Which will probably involve taking it up the pit, though the tiny goblin tunnels and all the way through the woods. Dietrich has a genius idea, fitting his education and background. If we pry the mirror from its frame, it will be a lot smaller. Eisen has another genius idea. If we pry the gems out of the frame too, it will be a lot richer. Attempted vandalism ensues, and every time we touch the mirror, it begins briefly showing something horrible, and then someone horrible. I would call him devious, in fact. He begins hissing something very insulting at us, and Fiona seems to understand him, confirming our suspicions. The devil begs us to stop acting like chimps and breaking the priceless artifact. It's nearly the last of its kind, and destroying such a work of art would be pretty horrible even for the man. He even gives us helpful advice. We shouldn't try to bring Namir the Gwyn, just bring her to the mirror instead. He also notes our destructive potential and offers us a deal. There's an elf of ancient bloodline that wronged him in the past. The devil really, really wants him dead, and he's willing to make one of us a warlock if we agree to it. The only person interested in such a power is Dietrich, and even then, briefly. The rest of the group decides that making deals with the devil is a bad idea. The player might or might not have had experience with this in the previous campaign. The session ends and some important stuff happens off session. Namely, Faust's player gets called names for a role playing a thug instead of a monk. Also, this is the moment where the sorcerer's player disappears. When our next session starts, Faust's player announces how when the party wakes up, their monk is nowhere to be found. His staff is left behind and that's all that's left from him. The DM says, no, fuck that noise. Since you're switching characters for no good reason, you're rolling this whole thing through. Oh, he's switching characters. Yes, that might be for the best. First, he rolls for stealth in order to not wake the party up when he's leaving. He fails spectacularly and wakes up the entire party instead. 
We gather around him and begin asking him questions he really doesn't want to answer, such as, Where are you going? Why are you leaving? How exactly are you going to survive by yourself? Those are all the questions he really doesn't want to answer, but in the end, he does mumble something about, I know you're in the right hands and you will survive here. And so he climbs out of the pit and leaves, silent and graceful. Just kidding. The DM makes him rule for athletics for every 10 feet of the pit in order to not fall down. He falls down around 6 times, nearly killing himself, until he actually makes it out successfully. And this is the end of the tale of Faust the Renegade. Just kidding. The DM makes him roll for survival, too. Remember how I've told you that we never use the hiding and rotating map feature because we had the ranger with us? Well, when I was saying that, I didn't think that I'll be telling the story this far. Faust wanders the woods for about 10 hours, lost, confused, and hungry, until he bumps into Gwen's hut, where he finds the rest of the party comfortably sleeping outside. He joins them, naturally. When the party wakes up, they're surprised to see Faust's mug again. Even Gwen is amused by the situation. Once again, he says goodbyes and hastily leaves. Cue to even more failed survival checks. On his way out of the forest, Faust the Renegade is eaten by wolves. Back to the cave. The party decides to loot everything before leaving, and we're really saddened by the fact that we can't steal Barsom's hammer. In our search for riches, we find some sort of diary. I read that as dairy for a second. <laughs> a Minotaur's dairy. Some sort of diary that the Minotaur has written back when he was an elf. It talks a lot about some mysterious threat. It name drops the priestess called Miralith several times, and most importantly, it talks about the Covenant. It doesn't actually say what the Covenant does, but it seems that it's a spell of some kind. In this dairy, and this diary contains the third known to Barsom. Okay, that doesn't sound important at all, and it probably won't matter in the long run. We're here for the Golden Cup, remember? We are hired by a merchant to retrieve it. So, after we abandon our insane plans to take the mirror to the surface, we climb up the pit. Just kidding. The DM decides that now is the time to teach us the importance of skills and class features. So we also have to make athletic checks every 10 feet to climb up. Since none of us actually has athletics leveled, we fall down again and again, nearly dying in the process. Eventually, Aizen does successfully get up and throw down a rope. The DM sounds really smug. That's what we get for mocking Thief's class features. Climbing is useful. Sure, sure it is. Once per the campaign, during a very special episode, we can get out of the cave without any troubles. We don't even meet the cube on the way out, surprisingly. We get to Gwen's hut without any trouble. Tell her that Barsom is dead and the path to the mirror is free. Afterwards, we take a long rest. For the night is dark and full of terrors. In the morning, we see our old friend Faust. Not for long, though, since he's hasty to leave again. The witch is back, too. She's slightly displeased with the fact that we forgot to mention a roaming homicidal cube, but is quick to forgive us. We're like your retarded cousin. You know it's not his fault. He can't help it. And that's the end of part one of the Spiderwood Hero Gang. Well, hold on. <laughs> the Heroes of Spiderwood. Sorry, let's look at the title again. If you like this story and others like them, be sure to like and subscribe to the channel of Neckbeardia, as well as click the bell icon so you know when the videos are released through the week. If you like even more original stories written through the week slash month slash year, be sure to stop by Garbeardia, where you can read or listen to a brand new story whenever it's released. Fresh off the presses, new by my hands, unseen by many. But this has been Guard Bro, and until I see you next time on this side of the veil, this has been Neckbeardia.